Hello, and welcome back to part one of the Concurrent and Network Software Design Dimensions module. In this part of the module, we're going to discuss key communication design dimensions, which will allow us to evaluate the pros and the cons of alternative designs that apps and services can use to interact with each other across different process address spaces. We're going to be focusing on communication design at the middleware and operating system layers. The main reason for doing this is this is where some of the most interesting design dimensions occur and also where people have the biggest opportunity to optimize the software so it'll work effectively for the upper layer services and applications as well. Obviously, if you are developing software or using software at this level, then knowledge of these design dimensions will make you a more effective programmer and architect. Even if you're not developing this lower level infrastructure software or using it directly, however, the higher level services and higher level applications you may be using possibly will provide you with various configuration options and tuning options. So knowing what the different design dimensions are will help to make you more effective as an integrator and a configurer of the way in which these software systems work. The topics we'll be describing in this part of the module are covered in a paper whose URL I provided at the bottom of the screen. The first topic we're going to discuss are the pros and cons of connection-oriented and connectionless protocols. A communication protocol is a set of rules that specify how control and data information is exchanged between computing systems. There's a nice discussion here at Wikipedia about communication protocols that I recommend you take a look at if you don't have much familiarity with this particular topic. Connection-oriented protocols work by providing a reliable, sequenced, and non-duplicated delivery service. So you can send bytes or messages on one side and expect those bytes and messages to show up on the receiver side or sides in order in, without losing the data. Typically, these are these connection-oriented protocols have an initialization phase where there's some handshaking that takes place, where you communicate your intent to exchange messages between the sender and the receiver. This typically involves setting up some state information at both endpoints or multiple endpoints so you can keep track of what's been delivered, what hasn't, and so on. The good thing about connection-oriented protocols that provide this kind of service is the fact that for applications that can't tolerate data loss, they make things much easier for upper-level services and applications to leverage on top of. A uh, good example of a protocol that works this way is the TCP protocol, which provides you with reliable, sequenced, and, and delivery that will be uh, uh, non-duplicated. The downside with connection-oriented protocols, of course, is there's some time that's required to do the initial connection establishment. And it also requires some state to be maintained on the various endpoints, which could be a problem if things tend to crash a lot, for example. You have to keep coming back up and reestablishing those, those protocols again and again. Take a look at this URL from the Wikipedia site for more information about connection-oriented protocols. The alternative design choice are called connectionless protocols. In these environments, they provide a, an unreliable delivery service where datagrams can be routed and delivered independently of each other. A good example of something that works this way is the user datagram protocol, or UDP, where you can call send to and receive from operations to send and receive the datagrams between different endpoints. The nice thing about using connectionless protocols, the pros, is that they take less state to set up, and they also have lower delay to initiate, because there's no handshaking that takes place before the data begins to flow. The downside, of course, is that these datagrams can be lost or reordered. So they give you best effort service, but that's about it. There's a nice description here at Wikipedia about connectionless protocols you might also want to take a look at. Uh, by and large, most systems these days tend to run on top of connection-oriented protocols, particularly TCP. But there are some services we'll talk about later that still do use UDP and connectionless protocols as well. And of course, under the hood, the Internet protocol, or IP protocol, is connectionless. And that requires the use of higher level protocols like TCP in order to be able to give you better confidence your data is being delivered end to end. Another design decision has to do with data encoding strategies. 
One way to encode data is to encode it as text strings. Text-based protocols are oriented around these strings rather than around binary data structures. The benefit of using strings is it's much easier for humans to read and arguably easier for to write tools that process text-oriented protocols. The downside, not surprisingly, is that these protocols tend to be a lot more verbose, which means they take more time to process, they take up more space, both in terms of being stored on an end system as well as being transmitted throughout a network. So if you're processor limited or your network bandwidth limited, there may be some issues here with too, ver too much verbosity. The alternative strategy is binary-based data encoding. In this model, binary protocols are oriented around binary data structures rather than around text strings. And the main reason that they are used, one of their, their benefits, one of the pros, is that they tend to be much faster and smaller than text-oriented approaches because they're intended for machines to process rather than people. The downside, of course, is it's much harder to understand what's going on when you're using a binary-oriented protocol because you have to have a special tool like a packet analyzer to go in and understand what the information is. It also tends to make things perhaps a bit more tightly coupled in some ways as well. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, in practice, people sometimes combine a bit of both. Uh, protocols like MIME use text for the metadata and then for certain encoding types, the data itself, like an image or so on, is actually sent in binary format. The, there used to be a lot of debate about which approach was better. And over time, people have realized it, it depends on what it is you're trying to do. If you're in an environment where you're, you have plenty of bandwidth, plenty of CPU, and you're trying to make it easy for people to take a look at what's being sent and received or, or write tools that are easy to crack open the messages, then text-oriented approaches work fine. In contrast, if you're in an embedded system or a real-time embedded system where you're kind of short on processor speed, memory is tight, you may not have all the networking bandwidth that you'd like, then the binary-oriented approaches may be more appropriate because you'll be able to do things in a faster and smaller way. So the bottom line is one is not right or wrong. They have different trade-offs, and it's important as an architect to understand how to navigate through these design dimensions. Another design dimension has to do with connection multiplexing. Let's assume for the moment we're using a connection-oriented protocol like TCP. Well, if you start to build higher-level middleware and services and applications, one thing you have to think about is how you want to use those connections in your software, in your network software. Uh, one way to do it is to use what's called a multiplexed connection. In this approach, all client requests from threads within a process or perhaps multiple processes on the same machine pass via a single TCP connection to a server process. The nice thing about this approach is it conserves OS resources. You only have to manage one connection per unit of multiplexing. And that means that you don't have to have as many sockets, TCP IP control blocks, and so on and so forth, which could be important in some environments where you're, you're limited in the amount of resources you have at your disposal. The downside with multiplex connections, however, is that they're harder to implement. It's harder to do multiplexing. They also tend to be less efficient because there's more overhead to manage the protocol for accessing that shared connection, that shared pipe. And they also have a tendency to be less deterministic because you're funneling or multiplexing together multiple streams of communication that may in fact run at different priorities at higher layers in the application or middleware. So the alternative approach is something called non-multiplex connections. In this way of doing things, each client has its own connection to communicate with a peer service. For example, each thread might have its own connection. Uh, you may, in fact, in some cases, have a pool of connections that are used to communicate. But the basic idea here is that this allows you some benefits, such as the ability to have finer level control over end-to-end -end priorities. You can make sure that the thread priority on the sender side matches up with the networking connection priority going all the way to the threads on the receiver side. And you can also sometimes get by with less synchronization overhead at the operating system, middleware, and higher level application services by using non-multiplex connections. The downside with this approach, it tends not to scale quite as well because you're using more operating system resources. and uh, you may also end up with situations where you simply run out of those resources, things like number of sockets, 
may not scale, uh, or amount of memory that's used to allocate may not scale. Clearly, over time, as we have bigger and faster machines, these kinds of issues become less and less problematic. But there was a time when the choice between multiplex and non-multiplex connection strategies was very important. We wrote a paper a number of years ago that compared and contrasted multiplex and non-multiplex connection strategies to see how they behaved in an environment for distributed real-time and embedded systems and middleware. Another design dimension has to do with synchronous versus asynchronous exchange of messages. Synchronous message exchange is one approach where the sender and receiver run in a stop and wait mode. In other words, synchronous lockstep. The sender sends a request and the request thread blocks until the receiver sends back a response. The nice thing about this approach is it's fairly intuitive for people who want to have their network applications and network services look and feel pretty much like you're making local function calls or local procedure or method calls because it's a stop and waste interaction just like when you make a method call in a standalone system in the same address space. The downside, of course, is that this approach, this synchronous approach, doesn't really take full advantage of the inherent parallelism in the networking and the operating systems and the hardware, where really things are in fact going in parallel, but you're kind of stuck in this lockstep, wait and stop, request response model. So an alternative way of structuring your software is to use asynchronous message exchange. In this model, senders can send out requests without waiting for receivers to respond back before they continue to send out more requests. The benefit here, of course, is it's possible to leverage the inherent parallelism in the network and systems much more effectively. You can have overlapping between sending and receiving of messages. And even if you only have one thread of control or two threads of control, you still may be able to get better parallelism and better throughput through the overall system by using an asynchronous approach. Some of the cons, this approach is a little harder to program often because of the separation in time and space between the sending and the receiving of these messages asynchronously. And of course, it also requires some sort of protocol, either at the application level or in the middleware, to detect lost or failed requests and perhaps resend them later. Uh, if you play your cards right, however, and you build the appropriate layers of middleware, you can do a very nice job of encapsulating some of these challenges with asynchronous message exchange. There's a couple of papers on my website that talk about how CORBA defines an asynchronous method invocation model that does a really nice job of hiding a lot of the complexities of asynchrony while still being able to improve performance and scalability effectively. Yet another dimension has to do with message passing versus shared memory. Message passing, which is what we've been talking about most of the discussion to this point, involves exchanging data via inter-process communication mechanisms. Things like pipes, Unix domain sockets, sockets, regular sockets, internet sockets, and so on. The good thing about using the message-oriented exchange approach is that both local and remote communication looks and feels more or less the same. There, of course, may be some additional error conditions you have to check for and remediate for the remote case, but your software will look about the same in both cases. The downside, of course, is that you may end up incurring extra unnecessary overhead for situations where you're communicating between processes in the same machine through some kind of loopback mode, some kind of channel that occurs through the operating system kernel on the same device. And that may incur a fair amount of overhead, especially as the messages grow in size. So an alternative approach people sometimes use is based on shared memory. In this model, shared memory is mapped into one or, or two or more process address spaces, and the different processes can communicate with each other by exchanging the data through the shared memory segments. And the nice part about this is if you do it right, you can have higher performance for large data exchanges with fewer copies and fewer other sources of overhead. And uh, this also is something that's frequently used in the implementation of middleware to be able to do various kinds of optimizations when communication is known to be taking place between different processes that are running on the same machine. The downside with this approach, of course, is it doesn't really generalize to remote communication. 
distributed shared memory is something that even despite many, many decades of research is still not really ready for prime time in the large with respect to performance issues because of the challenges of trying to figure out how to do caching and cache management in a distributed system. The other tricky issue with shared memory is it tends to be more error prone and non-portable. If you try to use uh, objects like C++ objects in shared memory, you have to be very careful that they don't have virtual pointers. Or if you do use virtual pointers, that you've used special compiler directives to make sure that those virtual pointers are pointing to virtual tables that are in the same locations in the different shared memory segments. Uh, likewise, if one app or service runs amok and messes up the internal data structures of the shared memory, that can easily corrupt other applications that are linked in to that shared memory. That kind of problem would not typically occur in a message passing environment because the sender and receiver can't access each other's memory directly, but instead they talk back and forth through the operating system kernel in the loopback device. So to summarize this part of the module, if you're programming standalone applications, the way in which you communicate between the various components is fairly straightforward and efficient and well known. You make function calls or method calls, you pass data as parameters, maybe you put the data into global variables or singletons and so on. When you start working in a networked environment, however, you have to think about the communication design dimensions much more deeply. You have to figure out ways in order to be able to communicate effectively between things that run in separate address spaces. You have to deal with the protocols, the encoding strategies, the multiplexing issues, the use of synchronous versus asynchronous communication. These kinds of issues require some additional thought. And either you'll have to confront those design dimensions directly in your software, if you're programming to the lower layers in the stack, or you'll be leveraging middleware, where the middleware architects and developers thought those issues through on your behalf. And either they've come up with a solution that works for your use case, or hopefully they provided you with various knobs to turn in order to ensure you get the appropriate quality and performance you've come to expect. The topics that we're discussing here are covered in some of the chapters in one of the books I've written on C++ network programming. And you might take a look there for some additional coverage in depth on some of these issues. Not surprisingly, there's lots of patterns lurking in these various design dimensions. And as we get into later parts of the course, we'll cover those patterns in much more detail.